we're going to start today with a question. It's a question I've been asked many times, and it may even be a question you've asked yourself. So if God hardened Pharaoh's heart, why then did God punish Pharaoh for it? We are going to answer that question today and hopefully so many more. Hi, I'm Heather and we are at the feet of Jesus where we are going through the entire Bible one book at a time and we are in the book of Exodus and we are cha- we are studying chapters 7 and 8 today. We are in the plagues and I just this is a part of scripture that I grew up on. I think a lot of us grew up on the stories and Charlton Heston on the TV and it's so fun to study the real stories and get into some of the questions like the one I just discussed at the opening. So we will get to it and we have a lot to do. But first of all, I wanted to say that we've had several um, subscribers lately and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are at 131 subscribers and I could not be more pleased. If you are just tuning in and you have not subscribed, please subscribe so that you don't miss a story. We are going through the entire Bible and my faithful followers who have uh, done these workbooks and and everything with me, um, I think we all can say, me included, that we're learning a lot. And so join us on this journey of learning this amazing Word of God, our scripture, our Bible. So it's fun. So let's get into it, shall we? We're going to start with chapter 7, verse 5. I'm going to read it because it's just kind of interesting. It says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand and on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So, no. No. And the Egyptians shall know. I've talked about this before, but when I'm going through this and reading, the Holy Spirit will just kind of tap me on the shoulder and tell me to stop. And this is one of those words that I was just told to stop. And so I stopped and I really started thinking about this. You all, if you have been listening at all, you know that I just went on a mission trip to Costa Rica last week. Well, got back last week anyway, a few weeks ago. And one of the speakers that were there, her name is Beth, and she is a dear, dear, dear friend. And she gave us all an exercise. And she explained it that when she was on her way to work, she lives in California. And so it's a 30 minute drive to work on on a good day, probably. So when she was on her way to work one day, she was really just kind of down there were some things that had been going on and she was just down going on to work, trying to figure out how to get through her day. And and she just started talking to God. And she said, you know, I know that I am a daughter of the King. I know that you have a plan for my life. I know that you gave Esther the courage she needed to do all the amazing things that she did and to save the people of Israel. I know that you provided love for Ruth. I know that you fed at least 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fishes. I know, I know, I know, I know. And so she just said that by the time she got to work, 30 minutes after starting this exercise, she was shouting in her car. She got out of the car, confident, ready to hit the world. So that is what I was thinking about when I read this. So let me read it again. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Do you know that Jesus Christ is Lord today? Oh my goodness gracious. If you don't, please stay tuned and and watch this and contact us. We would love to lead you in prayer in a relationship with the King of Kings and change your life. But you know what? If you are already a believer and you have a bad day, do what Beth does. I know, I know, I know until you're shouting the truth of who you are in Christ. It brings so much freedom and 
I just, with that idea in mind, I read these two chapters, just feeling such a heaviness in my heart for Pharaoh and the bad choices he made. And it was, it was sad, 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 sad. Okay. So speaking of bad choices and the teaser we made at the beginning, I'm going to start talking about the hardening of a heart. So that is something we're going to talk about quite a bit today, but I want to start. It's all over these two chapters of scripture. And the very first time we see it is in verse three. And it says, I see two and four. Okay. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Okay. That says God's going to harden his heart. But then we go down to 13, among many other places. And verse 13 of chapter seven says, I'm going to start at 12. For every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Okay, so this is Pharaoh hardening his own heart, but back in chapter, in verse three, it says that the Lord will harden his heart. Keep in mind that when anything like that happens in scripture, look up. The look up the words in the original language. Sometimes English is so limiting. And when you look back at ancient Hebrew, where we are here in the Old Testament, or Greek, where we are in the New Testament, you can really get some insight. And we got insight into this information. So when Pharaoh is hardening his own heart, it, the word is kabod, and it means heavy, dull, oppressive, unresponsive. But then when God is hardening his heart, the word is, and I don't know how to pronounce it. it I've heard it pronounced two ways, Hazak or Kazak. I'm not sure which way it is the right one, but that is when God is hardening Pharaoh's heart. And that means to strengthen, fortify. And so what God is doing there is Pharaoh is making his heart unresponsive, making his own heart unresponsive. And God allows, finally, we, we get it much more in plague. There's 10 plagues. We're only going to do the first four plagues today in these two chapters. But starting in verse six, we start seeing that word more and more and more, uh, Kazakh, Kazakh, Kazakh. So in the first four, the first five, really, we see much more of Pharaoh making his heart unresponsive, Pharaoh making his heart unresponsive, Pharaoh making his heart unresponsive. And then God will strengthen Pharaoh's heart to what he was already thinking. We're going to get into it, but boy, I don't ever want to be in that boat. Okay, so then we're going to get into another interesting point. Well, before we do that, I do I do want to just point out one more detail about the hardening of a heart. We've seen it all over in Genesis and, and even at the beginning of Exodus. God will God is so full of grace and mercy. And even though we see a lot of the um God that we are right to fear and we are right to respect and we are right to understand his immense power. Uh, it can be one of those things that we see it and we see him saying, go and fight for this land and I will give it to you. Meaning these people that live in this land will die. We see that over and over. And we need to keep in mind that God always gives choice. He always gives choice. He's giving a choice to Pharaoh. He gave, let's look at right after Genesis, before Exodus, there's a span of 350, 350 to 400 years where he, God was getting the land ready for the children of Israel and getting the children of Israel ready for the land. And that's when the children of Israel are in Egypt and enslaved. And so what do I mean? And we studied it, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But what do we mean by 
God getting the land ready? Well, the Canaanites lived there. We went through a lot of the horrible, horrible, horrible things that the Canaanites were doing. But God gave the Canaanites 350 to 400 years to repent. And finally, God said, okay, if you're not going to follow my will, I will follow yours. I don't ever want to get into a place where God says, if my will not be done, your will be done. I don't want my will done. <laughs> I want the Lord's will because the Lord's will in my life is perfect. And so anyway, that's where we see the Canaanites and that's where we are now. God is going to let the children of Israel have that land because he is just, he's saying, okay, done. And so also we have that here. We have God allowing Pharaoh to repent and to make the right decision. Uh, and then finally, God goes, okay, Pharaoh's not doing this. And so I'm going to strengthen what Pharaoh is already thinking. That's where we are. We cannot in our lives ever confuse God's long suffering, his patience, his grace, and his mercy with his approval. God wasn't approving of what the Canaanites were doing. God wasn't approving of what Pharaoh was doing. God was just allowing them time to repent. So I just really wanted to hit that. Now we're going to hit the Egyptians or the magicians. So the magicians is an interesting, interesting point. Uh, one of my friends who really helped me see this over the years is a friend that I'll give a shout out to. Her name's Gail. And so Gail always helped me see that Satan cannot create. And so I thought of Gail when I was reading this part of the scripture. So this is um, still in chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. So this is the first time when the magicians are going to copy what Aaron does. So Aaron drops his uh, staff and the staff turns into a snake. And so the magicians drop their staff and the, Egypt the magicians staffs turn into snakes, but then Aaron's snake eats the snake of the magicians. But then we see it again with the blood. We see it with the frogs. And um, so we see the magicians copying what Aaron and Moses do, what God does. The magicians cannot create. They can only replicate, distort, confuse. That's what they're doing. And that is the same with Satan. Satan cannot create. He was never given the opportunity or the power or the ability to create. Satan is not the counter equal to God. God is much higher. You have God and then you have the angels. And Satan is one of the angels that fell when he wanted to be like God. And so a Satan cannot create, but he can distort. We see it in our lives. One of my biggest, the biggest examples is through intimacy, physical intimacy that a husband and wife share. We have seen it distorted into pornography, into um, sexual um, sexual issues that were never, never created by God. And so pornography is the biggest one that, that I can think of at this moment. Another one that I thought of was needs versus greed. So God and his graciousness. So grace is getting something we don't deserve. So God and his grace gives us what we need. But then Satan distorts our needs for our wants and our wants can turn into greed and that greed can turn into uh, needing to do things that are wrong, like maybe violence or theft to get other things we want. And so that's two examples. One of your comment questions today, please, please, please think of something that God created that Satan distorts. I would love to get more examples on that one. So then we have the first plague. The first plague is blood. One thing I saw as I was reading and researching through this is the plagues 
nearly all of them have a counter God that God is destroying of the Egyptians. He's just shining a light on the absence of power of these gods, these ancient Egyptian gods. And so the very first one is the Nile itself. The Nile itself was worshipped. And so the to to turn that the Egyptians hated the idea of blood. And so to turn a, the Nile that they worship into blood, oh, I cannot even imagine how awful, awful, awful. You will start to see that each plague gets a little bit more bothersome, gets more severe. You'll start to see this. So this plague number two was fascinating. It's frogs. And okay, I think frogs would be a horrible nuisance. But we start to learn that there is an ancient Egyptian goddess, and there's two different pronunciations for her name, Heka or Hecate. And I'm going to just say Heka. So Heka was a, the body of a woman, but the head of a frog. You can Google her. She, It's kind of an interesting picture. But that way, with frogs, they kind of felt like they were from this goddess. And so it was illegal to kill frogs. So now think of that plague with that in mind. Doesn't that just bring oh, some pictures? Okay, I'm going to help you with pictures that you're going to have in your mind. Are you ready? So one of the things I love to do is I love to look up extra biblical information. So extra biblical is not something that is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God, and but not these things. But we can look at ancient historians, and that's what I like to look at, just to bring an extra insight into some pictures that we can have in our mind. So this is one of those things, and I'm going to read it to you. I had to print it out because I could not do justice to this. So Heraclides Limbus tells us that in Phonia and Dardania, such a number of frogs fell from heaven as filled the public roads and private houses. At first, the inhabitants killed them. So remember, it was illegal to kill the frogs. And so it must have been so awful and so numerous that they said, it's okay, it's okay, we're just going to start killing them. So again, at first the inhabitants killed them and keeping their houses shut, bore it patiently for some time. But when it signified nothing and their household goods were covered with them and they were found, they, and they found them boiled and roasted with their food. Oh, can you imagine? And lay in such heaps that they could not tread for them. They could not walk except for on, on frogs. And were so distressed with the smell of the dead ones, they forsook their country. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that help you see what we're talking about with the first plague? This isn't just a nuisance. This is a disgusting nuisance. I want you to think of the last time you left something in your refrigerator and then your refrigerator started stinking and you found the awful thing and you opened the container and the smell. Can you imagine that times a thousand, a thousand, maybe a hundred thousand with all the frogs rotting in the streets? Yeah. Awful. Okay. So then we have Pharaoh going, okay, okay, I can't handle it. I can't handle the frogs. And he comes to uh, Moses and he says, Moses, this has to stop. And this is interesting. So he's, uh, let's see. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron. This is chapter eight, verse eight. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, accept the honor. So Moses is being quite nice. Accept the honor of saying when I shall in intercede for you and for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the rivers only. So he's, so he's saying, 
When, Pharaoh, would you like me to entreat? I will do what you'd like. And then the answer, the most berserk quest answer. I Oh, my heavens. Verse 10. So he said, Pharaoh said, tomorrow. And he said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you and your houses, from your servants and from your people. They shall remain in the rivers only. Oh my goodness gracious. If that story that I read to you from the ancient historian, if that's true, why tomorrow? Why tomorrow? Okay, we don't know because scripture doesn't tell us, but there's some theories out there. Um, one of the theories is from another one of the historians that, that I read. It said there's two reasons that are usually thought about. One is that he might hope that it would kind of handle itself. And then he should not be beholden to the Lord, to God. Uh, or or Moses. And then the other is that he thought an affair of this kind would not be able to be done immediately, but that it re- might require some time for intercession and performed rites and, and ceremonies and that kind of thing. So those are two options. Again, here's another question for comments. And um, I want my comment girls to tell me what they think. What do you think? Why do you think he said tomorrow? Anyway, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. So Then we have plague number three. So plague number three is lice or gnats. Hey, evidently the gnats, the the gnats, another historian that I read said that he, that there's an eyewitness that walked into the land and the land was such, the dirt was such that it was moving. That's what we're talking about here. The gnats were like the sand. They were so innumerable. They would crawl up your legs and they would bite you on the way up. Awful. Here's just an interesting observation that every third plague is not given warning. So first plague, there was warning. Second plague, there was warning. Third plague, no warning. Interesting. And then fourth warning, fifth warning, sixth no warning, seventh warning, eighth warning, ninth, no warning. So anyway, as as it might be, but I thought that was kind of interesting. So there was an Egyptian god named Geb, and um, he was a, a little tiny, he was the god of these little tiny insects and that kind of thing. Interesting. I don't know. You know, God just did his work and destroyed all these, the the power of these gods. I thought it was kind of interesting. So verse 18 says, now the magicians so worked with their enchantments. So at this point, all the magicians did was add more blood to the river. And then the magicians added more frogs to the river. And then we have verse 18. Verse 18 says, now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. Remember, magicians, Satan cannot create. And so these magicians couldn't create. And so, goodness gracious, what was Pharaoh thinking when the magicians, all they would do is add to this awfulness, but that's what they were trying to do. So I have, so we have learned that Satan, through scripture, that Satan needs permission to inflict harm. Where do we learn that? Shout out the phone in Job. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit of Job to you. And um, it's Job chapter two. And we're going to start... At verse two, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. 
but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So God said, okay, you can do something to Job, but you have to spare his life. So we learn from that and in several different places in the book of Job that God has to grant permission and God had stopped permission at that time. The the magicians are a nuisance. They're done. And so that's one point. And then verse 19, it says that the, that the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. If you look up that word God, it is not Yahweh. It is a plural form of God, form of God. And so they were just saying, this is the finger, this is supernatural. That's what they were saying. So then we have the last plague that we're going to talk about today, and it's flies. Now, Josephus, an ancient historian, says it was a mixture of flies and, and scorpions and serpents. I don't know. I, I know what it says here. So we're going to say flies. Here's an interesting thing. We learn here that this did not happen. And this is one question I've always had. I've always had the question, okay, why did all these things happen to, if it happened to, to the Egyptians, wasn't that, if it happened all over Egypt, wasn't that hurting the children of Israel too? How awful for the children of Israel to have to live through that. But here we learn that it wasn't, that they did not have to endure this. And when we look at the words, we can see it, that God says, um, this will happen to your people in your home and they will be in your bed and in your talking to Pharaoh. So we learn that here and there. But I learned through um, a cross-reference of 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9, that judgments from Satan that we do have to endure. That's part of being human. That's part of being here on the earth and not at home in heaven yet. But judgments from God, we don't. So 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9, starts out, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and do not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood, on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, uh, would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelled among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day, by seeing and hearing their flawless deeds. Then the Lord knows who, how to deliver the godly out of tempt, uh, temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So the Israelites, the, the children of Israel, were not having to live through all of this awfulness. So we are going to, they had to live amongst it. They didn't have frogs crawling all over them, and they didn't have to deal with the fleas. And So, anyway, we are going to talk about the workbook. Here's the workbook, available $9.95 on Amazon. Pick it up, pick it up. So, main themes of the week. I really almost combined this with theological implications today. So, themes of the week. Keeping our hearts moldable. No one ever plans on having a hard heart. And I don't even think a true Christian who has Jesus, who has the Holy Spirit in him, can have a completely hard heart like, like um, Pharaoh. But we need to be so very, very careful to keep our hearts the opposite of heart, to keep our heart, hearts moldable and to not ever go down that road where our hearts can get harder. 
we need to keep our hearts open to what God is trying to teach us, what God allows in our life, and what God is trying to teach and, and help us to learn. So let's not be ever in a place where we are anywhere near what the Pharaoh had, what Pharaoh had to deal with. Then individual verses. I had two because they were very, they stuck with our point. Exodus 8, 25, and that is, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God in the land. Go. And then, what is that? Seven short verses later in Exodus 8, 32, he says, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Whew. Okay, then we have our lesson for the week, which was Exodus 8, and then verses 8 through 15 was our study verses. The verse we're going to study in detail is 8.15, and this is it. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. So again, our hearts cannot be ever be completely hard if we have the the Holy Spirit in our hearts. But we can certainly wreak havoc on our faith and our lives, on our relationship with the King of Kings when we forget him in the good times. And so, you know, my heart longs for Christ when I've had a tough time, when I am in turmoil or in trial and it hurts and I long for him and I sit with him. But I'm also training my heart to see him in the good times, to see how much he is with me all the time and working with me all the time and loving me all the time and helping me in life all the time, not just during the bad, when I cling to him, he's there during the good times. And that's what I want. I don't ever, ever, ever want to forget God in the, in the good times. So what are we going to put at the feet of Jesus today, ladies and gentlemen? I would propose, I would like to put finding God in the good moments of my day and thanking him always, always, always. And also just never allowing my heart to become anywhere near hard. I want it to always remain moldable and teachable. So that's what I'm putting at the feet of Jesus. What are you putting at the feet of Jesus today? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, we're trucking on along. Next week, it's just Exodus 9. So we only have one chapter and then we're going to keep going. But ladies, this and gentlemen, I keep forgetting, we do have gentlemen that listen to this, but it, we're having fun. And I'm so glad you're with me. And thank you. I pray for you. I'm praying that your days are going well. And I want to make a point that this is not a cliche. This is a fact of a Christian's life. What is it? That God's got this. God's got this. He's got your trouble. He's got your pain. He's got your heart. He's got the good things that are happening in your life. He's got this. This is not a cliche. It is a fact of a Christian's life. And just like I began, I will end. If you have not accepted Christ, please do so. Contact a Christian friend. Comment on here. We will get in touch with you and we will help lead you into a full, rich life with the King of Kings and the Holy God of the universe. Uh, oh, there's so much exciting things to do in our life. So, folks, so much fun. And I love you, and I'm thinking about you, and I'm praying for you, and God's got this. Mwah.